Wow, does a year pass by quickly. We, uh, last time I stood up here, we were showing you uh, pre-models, uh, computer-aided design models of Sapphire, uh, where we thought we were going to go. And tonight, uh, we're going to show you where we've come and how we got there. So uh, I'm not sure how fast I'll go through the presentation. I think I have, uh, what, 600 slides? No. <laughs> not that many, but uh, there's lots of colorful ones. We're going to get into some, uh, some of the hardcore engineering that goes into de uh, designing a machine of this nature and some of the questions that uh, the team had to address for us to uh, get where we are. So Sapphire, uh, Stellar Atmospheric Function in Regulation Experiment. It's a test of the electric sun model. And this model, um, let me see here, are we going? Okay. This is the overview. Here we go. The electric sun model. Uh, I was asked back in 2011, I'm just going to give you a really quick uh, overview for some of you that are new um, by the EU and by individuals to examine this model. And uh, uh, what I did is I compared it to the contemporary model. And I discovered that there is a lot of disparities with the contemporary model and came to the conclusion that, at least at this time here, it's not testable. But during this, I used uh, a st statistical evaluation tool called Designs of Experiments, which you can apply to filter through hypotheses or different models to determine uh, whether they can be tested or not. So that's really the first couple of years, and I came to the conclusion that I think that the electric universe model is based on the principle of charged plasma affecting matter of a different electrical potential. And I came to that conclusion uh, finally after Scott Mainwaring had given me uh, a book uh, written by Crooks where he had a cathode at one end of a, a small jar and an anode at the other end and had rubies in the center. And when he lit it up, uh, the rubies started to fluoresce and radiate is what he called it and what we call plasma discharge. But the rubies themselves were not part of the circuit. They were just in the plasma. And what it indicates is that there's certain elements that we know uh, now do not want to climb or fall to the electrical potential of its environment. And when that happens, that's when you end up with a plasma discharge. And it was based on that that I came to the conclusion that this, we may be able to test this. So phase one was a proof of concept, and it was really just to see if we could shake it out and see if it worked. Can we go in and we can recreate these things and can we introduce some instrumentation to do some measurements because the, the data and instrumentation to measure what's going on in plasmas is uh, extremely weak. There's not much information about it. And we're going to get into that. And uh, we did test it. And we discovered that it would work. We adjust pressure, voltage, so I'm going to introduce a little more helium right now, current, a little bit more. and time. And then we'll take another Time is also a key element. You want to sh shut when the proper combination be... of these uh, factors is arrived at, the plasma spontaneously ignites. Well, there we go. Point four is going down. Let's shut it off. Pumps and our gun is on. A glow discharge okay. forms in the chamber. So we just leave it here. It'll start climbing by itself. Look, yes. look, look at the emissions coming out. Look how bright it becomes. We adjust the various parameters to obtain a variety of plasma regimes. Look, 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 look on the surface. See the glow? What we're observing has no clear precedent. We are seeing things we did not expect. Look at the pressure changes. Nice, nice. Look at the spin, look at the spin. Yeah, look at the spin. And that was just the initial. Afterwards, we were able to control the plasma, and these are some of the uh, plasma phenomena that we observed and we were starting to measure. And these, uh, these double layers, we ended up finding that we had two, three, four, twenty. These aren't 
uh, uh, discs. These are spherical um, discharges. Plasma has a unique characteristic where it's translucent as you look through the center of it, and it looks like it's a disc, but in fact it's not. What you're looking at actually are spheres. And then we end up looking at things that had certain types of perturbations, but what we thought and looked at the geometry here was quite remarkable with the hexagonal type formation, and this is all moving. This is not static. Further to this, as some of you know, we uh, saw a dark uh, or an, an extremely intense ion cloud build up around the core, and this is very common for what we see happen in Sapphire. And when it did, it would uh, blow off into the chamber. And when that happened, it would often release uh, power surges of over 10 million watts. Now, what we did is we limited the power to 1,800 watts. Now, we don't understand this, but these are the things that we are going to now investigate in phase two. And this is what uh, you're going to be introduced to tonight. This is. Uh, kind of a panoramic shot of the lab. What you're looking at in the center there is the chamber, which can, uh, it's about three cubic meters. It's about seven feet long, and it's about four feet in diameter. And uh, we're going to go and explore the engineering that went behind this, or what's behind this. This is SAFCON. Everybody in the team, we had to come up with a name. We said, well, let's call it the control room, and nobody liked that, so we said, okay, well, it's really, they came up with the name SAFCON. So this is SAFCON, and this is kind of, a, again, a panoramic uh, view here. It's not complete in this picture of uh, where the main control for gas, vacuum, data acquisition, and in real time, uh, we get to monitor what's going on with all the systems in the chamber. Now, there are two things that we're going to talk about tonight. One of them is systems, which is the chamber itself, to maintain its stability so that it's a stable... Uh, experimental environment, and the other is the data that we get back from the instruments like the Langmuir probe, optical spectroscopy, mass spectroscopy, and other things. So you're not looking at the sun. This is the result of the first discharge from Sapphire Phase Two, and this is what happened. And uh, so we believe now that it is scalable. Well, we know it's scalable. So the sapphire environment, we know that the plasma itself is extremely intense. We know that it's uh, extremely hot. And one of the things that happen in a plasma discharge, uh, one of the characteristics of a plasma is what we call radiation emissions. And radiation emissions is the thing that you feel when you walk outside and you feel the hot Phoenix sun after you've been in the shade. And those emissions in sapphire, uh, they travel at the speed of light and they impinge on the surface of the chamber. Now, I didn't think that this would be a big deal when we first started out because it's such a big chamber. It weighs almost 2,000 pounds. It's stainless steel. And I found out that that uh, actually was not the case. This is just a small graph to show you the different types of radiation, complete spectrum. You go right from um, what they call non-thermal, non thermal, optical, um, broken bands, gamma rays, X-ray, and ultraviolet. The stuff that we feel predominantly are within kind of the infrared to ultraviolet range when we walk out in the sun. But sapphire is going to experience many of these because it's an ionizing plasma. And this is what happens to the chamber. So when this radiation hits the surface of the chamber, some of it's reflected back, but in our case, because we have a certain type of finish, a lot of this energy is absorbed into that material. And there's transmitted radiation that comes off the outside. So if you think about your engine, it's got gas burning on the inside, and you feel the heat migrating through the engine, it gets extremely hot. And so you have this thermal um, uh, conductance within the material itself. So in engineering, um, we had to take a look at what we call potential failure modes. Uh, the melting of O-rings, is it going to get too hot? Uh, thermal stresses on viewports, thermal expansion of materials causing stress. Uh, thermal effect on cameras, electrical discharge, erosion of materials, deposition of materials. Uh, when you have a plasma, an ionizing plasma, uh, we watch things uh, get vaporized. 
And when we say vaporized, it, these are like happening in seconds. So you can have something that's metal and it, uh, <laughs> it's no longer there. So you gotta be careful um, about how much energy is in this chamber and you gotta have you know, good control over it. So potential failure modes. What temperatures are we dealing with? How long will it take to reach these temperatures? How do we limit thermal heating in the chamber? Uh, what are the thermal limitations of the gaskets? How do we limit the thermal heating of the viewports? What are the effects of thermal expansion? Potential failure modes. And it goes on. And the list is, becomes endless because once you have this radiation in here, it's like putting a very hot, let's say, uh, tungsten light bulb inside a shoebox. And that heat and that energy's got nowhere to go. And it'll cause a fire. Molecular solubility. Well, we're using hydrogen. Well, what about the polymer hoses that we're using? Well, they're designed to handle the hydrogen. Well, what happens if the polymer hose starts to heat up? Well, it opens up the molecular structure of the polymer hose. The hydrogen starts to migrate through, and maybe you get hydrogen embrittlement, and then you, you break a hose. Doesn't sound like a big deal, but if you've got pressurized hydrogen moving into the chamber, um, and you've got a very hot anode, it might uh, cause some <laughs> consternation amongst the team. <laughs> Lowell said, uh, I think we expect an explosion. And he said, well, if we do, it won't be very big. Now, you have to understand with Lowell what his background is, because he used to work at Los Alamos and Lawrence Livermore Labs and nuclear weapons. So, so I asked him, I said, are we talking about one megaton or, or 70 megatons? You know, are we just going to become like cosmic dust? So we have what we call a system. It's called Open Issues and Project Tracking. And that means that every single person on the team has a responsibility to, if you've, you think it's a problem, it's a problem unless we know that it isn't. It's broken unless we know that it's fixed. It's not going to work unless we know that it does. It's kind of a, you might consider it a negative approach. But in the automotive industry, we'd, we would do the same thing with your braking system on your car. Um, as an engineer, we would say, would you be happy if your brakes worked most of the time? Or do you, because I got accused of being a perfectionist one time, and that's the way I answered them back. And I said, well, you know, if I'm designing a braking system, do you want them to work most of the time, 90% of the time, 99% of the time? And what I discovered is that people want their brakes to work even if the pads are gone. So we look at where a system is going to fail. And if we can eliminate the failure modes, then we have a reasonable confidence that it's going to work. So there are thousands of issues. And each person on the team is signed, they're a champion. Uh, we uh, identify what the task or the issue is. The team discusses it amongst ourselves. We come up with a recommendation, the person can pursue it, and then come back maybe a day or two later, a week or a month, and say, okay, this is what I found, and maybe they are stuck on it. But the approach is, is that if any member on the team has an issue, the whole team has an issue. Because if they're stuck, we're all stuck. So we track through every single issue that we can think of. And that brings us to computational fluid dynamics. And it's a big word. And it's uh, science and engineering that is used uh, from designs of kettles to um, rockets, uh, fighter aircraft. Um, and it covers a wide range of things in thermodynamics. And it includes Radiation emissions, that's light emissions. It means fluids as well as gases. So gases fall under the same kinds of laws and principles in our calculations as what uh, uh, liquids do. So CFD is a, solid, it's a software solid modeler. It uh, uses proven applied mathematical equations, algorithms to evaluate the effects of various interacting and non-interacting factors affecting fluids, gases, and materials. So think about when they design the radiator of your car, they know that as a radiator heats up, it's going to expand. And if they didn't let it expand, it's going to break. It's going to leak. So you want to understand the materials and the effects of the, the heat on these kinds of materials. And the same thing happens in Sapphire. And you can do all these calculations at once with some of the most advanced solid modelers. So as I said before, um, at the beginning, I didn't think that thermal radiation was going to be too much of an effect because the thing weighs about 2,000 pounds. It's a lot of steel there. And I thought, okay, we can fire it up, and it's not going to be like the small bell jar. We can run it for maybe, you know, a number of hours. 
but what I discovered in my initial calculations is that um, even at 30 kilowatts, because you need more power, it's a bigger chamber, we would get maybe half an hour out of the chamber before things started to melt. And if we allow the chamber and the energy to go beyond that, maybe up to 80 kilowatts, uh, or even 165 kilowatts, which it has the capability of doing, because it's a big chamber, we might get uh, half an hour before it heats up to 500 degrees Celsius. And uh, when you see something that's red hot, that would be in the range of around five, 600 degrees Celsius. And that's where things start to melt. And that's a big problem. You can't run, a, you can't run an experiment. So what you're looking at here is a calculation that's called total heat flux. And you're going to kind of get a kind of a basic one-on-one -on -one engineering thing on, on this. And what I discovered, I discovered something that you might find very useful on the heating of the cores of planets and moons. But this here is showing you the anode in the center of the chamber. And as time goes on, uh, how radiation emissions uh, impinge on the surfaces of the materials and the chamber itself. Now the core plasma, remember, the core plasma we figure is around 3,000 degrees. But the radiation is leaving at the speed of light. And it's traveling through the atmosphere in the chamber because it's in a vacuum even faster than it travels through our atmosphere on Earth. So there's nothing to slow it down. There's nothing to stop it. So the static results, that was uh, Dr. Lowell Morgan's calculations. So he came up and he said, well, it looks like it's going to heat up to about 521 degrees Celsius. And I was coming up with numbers of around 535 degrees Celsius. Then I contacted some friends that were doing some work with NASA and uh, some aerospace down in the Carolinas. And they were saying maybe 550 degrees Celsius. So we have a problem. So what this is is some of the calculations. This is just really a return graph. I'm going to show you some other more graphical uh, representations of the results that the calculations came up with. But it meant we have a big problem. And it meant that I'd had to make a telephone call to Scott and say that if we ran the chamber, we could run it for about uh, 10 minutes before you see kind of a melting thing on the floor. And that's the end of Sapphire. <laughs> what this is here, um, you have static results, which means this is going to be the maximum temperature the chamber will come to, and it'll stabilize. The next, as you see right here, um, it's kind of migrating along. You see the graph drops down, it comes back up. That's giving us the time domain and how long it will take the chamber to heat. And we came up with approximately the same number, about 30 minutes. So then um, I thought, okay, well, I don't want to call Scott yet and say, <laughs> it's over. So I thought, well, uh, maybe we can cool it. So we'll wrap some water around it, okay, some hoses or whatever we need to do to see if we can cool the chamber. But as you can see here, the analysis is showing us that, well, where the hoses are, it's nice and cool, but right where the center of the chamber is, which is where the most of the heat is, it's going to be too complicated for us to get anything effective in there. And what you're looking at from the green to the red is what we call a thermal gradient. And it's too steep. You just don't do that to materials without causing a lot of stress and problems. So I'm thinking, well, um, how do we cool engines? What if we blew some air on it? So I started to do some analysis, and um, I thought, well, what if we put a fan on it, and we uh, suck the air down through a shroud along the surface, and we got some sort of laminar flow. And laminar flow falls under computational fluid dynamics, and this is the kind of math that they use to do wing design on aircraft. You know, how much laminar flow, how, how well will the air actually stick to the surface to lift the aircraft up? And air is in a very effective way to get rid of heat. You use it in your radiators in your car. So it looked promising. And I thought, okay, um, what we can also work out here is the flow of air over the surfaces. So we can effectively uh, predict how the winds or the air is going to flow over these surfaces to be more effective in cooling it more effective, more efficient. And this is some of the thermal distribution, and it's a lot more even. So we're not getting 500 degrees now. If I can get a fan uh, to pull air over the surface, we can bring the chamber into stability at around 100 degrees Celsius. Now that's something that we can work with. It's still going to boil water, but the worst case scenario is about 100 degrees Celsius. It's not going to melt gaskets. Yes, you could fry eggs on it, but 
uh, it's workable. So then I thought, well, I need a fan. <laughs> and that big blue thing is the fan that we came up with. Um, I told Scott that, yes, we have a solution, but what I didn't tell him at the time is just how big a fan we needed. And um, so he thought, okay, this is good, so we're going to keep moving ahead. And the fan actually will uh, suck about 14,000 cubic feet per minute at uh, a pressure of about two inches of uh, two atmospheres. Uh, not two atmospheres, but two inches of water, which basically would suck the air out of this room, all the air out of this room here, out, I would say approximately 30 seconds. So keep your hands and feet in at all times, you know. I mean, that's me standing there. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm looking at something, I guess. So then we looked at the outside, and that looked good. So let's take a look at the inside, because that's where the real nasty environment is. And what we can model now very accurately is what these conditions are. And the conditions is showing you with the little arrows. It's showing you, those arrows are showing you the effects of buoyancy, so as hot air heats, it rises. And so effectively, those arrows are showing you that it's going to rise, and it's giving you a velocity. Well, how fast is the gas rising? And uh, so this is gas. This is not radiation emissions. The radiation emissions are passing through the gas at the speed of light, but then there's the gas in the chamber, and how fast is it moving? Okay, do we have any kind of convection motion happening in here? And it's actually quite stable, if you look at it. The velocity is actually not that high. Is this moving? Yes. So what we're looking at here, I took a cross section and we're just kind of moving down through the chamber to the core, which is where the anode is. And it looks like a heck of a fire that's in there, and it is. But the velocities are very, very low. We're talking 0 0.0005 meters uh, per second. So it means the gas is not moving very quickly, which is good for us because it means that you know, gravity is going to have a limited effect on the plasma discharge, if that makes any sense. Okay, the gas is very stable inside. And this is just actually looking down into the core. So this here is the effect of what's called total heat flux. It's how you can heat up a body using electricity. So I'm just going to digress here from Sapphire just to talk about a possibility that the EU might want to consider because in the course of doing this analysis, it occurred to me that we use this tool all the time. And it means that the center of the anode might be around, let's say, 2,500 degrees Celsius. But the surface temperature of the anode was almost one order of magnitude cooler. And I thought, now what is going on? Like, you know, if you're going to heat it up, it should be just kind of a uniform heat. But in the analysis, what it showed is that the radiation emissions leaving the surface of the anode are leaving it at the speed of light but it takes a lot more time for the heat to migrate from the core through that very dense material that we call the anode. So if you think about it, you don't need gravity to heat the core of a planet or a moon, and this is a very effective mechanism to do this, and it does answer for why you could have hot cores in planets or moons that really by now, in my opinion, if they're as old as they say they are, should be frozen rocks, and they're not. And even with bodies that are even smaller than our own moon, might have uh, hot cores and volcanic activity. Just a consideration for the EU, but it's something that appears to me that uh, might have uh, some legs. So it's just another th kind of a three-dimensional view of the, um, the core. It's fun doing this work because it's really pretty. This is stuff you could put on T-shirts, you know. So this, again, uh, what we're looking at is the radiation and the effects of the radiation on components like the cathodes, because we have large cathodes, and you'll see them tonight. They're three feet in diameter. They're very thick copper. And what we have to identify now is whether or not they're going to melt or they're going to expand, and what kind of changes can we see occur in the chamber without it going into a failure mode. And this is really what it's showing you. The green means that it's cool. The red means it's hot. And the, the little arrows show you the direction that the air is moving or the gas is moving in the chamber. This here is the results. So the maximum temperature that we got 
from the radiation is about 600 degrees Celsius for the copper, and that's well within copper's ability to handle. It's going to get hot, but it's not going to melt. But when things heat up, they expand. And if you're holding something too rigid and it's wanting to expand, well, that's when you start to break things. So we can take the information that we've got and the results that we got from the computational fluid dynamics and read that directly into what's called finite element analysis. And that really deals with the structure, the strength of materials that's used in building buildings and cars and virtually every kind of thing that you can think of that undergoes any kind of stress. So if you take your hand on your, on your desk tonight and you just put your fingers on the edge and you push your hand down, you're going to get what's called displacement. If you feel your muscle stretching, this is what we would call stress. So things can displace like the aircraft, like the wings on an aircraft, but the stresses are within its limits so they don't break off. And this is basically what FEA does. And you can apply thermal um, uh, forces. And what this is showing us is the effects of the radiation emissions on the sapphire viewports. Okay, now if I was paying for this, we're, these are sapphire viewports. Now if anyone knows anything about vacuum chambers, these are really are not cheap viewports, okay? And you don't want to be blowing them out of your chamber because you've, you're subjecting them to extremely high stresses. And what this is saying in effect, as long as we've got air moving over top of the surface, we can keep it cooled down to a point where we can effectively use them without blowing, it, blowing the, the, the viewports out of the chamber. But what about the cathode? Well, you come up with some ideas. You want a nice flat disc. The team, we all agreed that a nice flat disc would be the most effective way to do this. And, but you've got to hold that disc up somehow. And uh, this was the first concept. And um, this here, what you're looking at, is kind of a pie-shaped section out of that round, that cathode that you'll see very soon. And what it's showing you is the stress is due to thermal um, forces. And you can see, uh, how do I do this here? I'm going to use the pointer now, see if it blows up on me. OK, you see right in this area here, the stresses are 370, uh, 372.9 uh, uh, megapascals. Now that might not mean much to most of you, but what it does say is that it's about 400% beyond what copper can handle. It means that the copper is going to, because of the expansion, uh, due to the deformation that we see here, the cathode under these temperatures is going to grow about half an inch. So how do we, how do we let it grow half an inch without, you know, the, the support structure breaking because it can't, it can't, it can't hold it anymore, you see. Okay, done. This is going so much better than last year. <laughs> so far. <laughs> okay, so what we say, well, look, let's, let's think of some concepts that come out of aircraft. Well, if the, if, the, if the wings on an aircraft were stiff, actually they'd break off. And when you take off in a big air, air, airliner nowadays, you can see the wings moving up. If they didn't, uh, those stresses would be so severe, they would actually crack and fracture and break off. And that's not a good thing. So <clears throat> what we're going to do with sapphire and what we did is we let we want to let it grow. Let it grow. So in this case here, you know, we just put a small joint in here. I don't know how well you can see it on the big screen, but there's a joint in here. And it's going to let the, the cathode grow and it's not going to put stresses um, on the structure in here, but the stresses that you can see here were actually supporting the cathode are 77 uh, megapascals, which is about 300% below what copper can handle. So we're in good shape. And I have enough experience with this to know that that's, it's going to work, okay? Okay, done. Don't push the wrong button. Okay. So systems. Systems, design, and engineering. Um, if you have a computer, you have a computer system. You have chips and you have wires and you have fans and you have cooling systems within that computer. And that system itself is hooked into a network called the internet and we have systems. And with this particular machine, we have to start breaking those systems out. 
into something that's actually going to work for us in a laboratory. So the main control panel, um, data feedback and capture, this is in SAFCON, video feedback, could we need to see what's going on in the chamber. Uh, we have a couple of, you know, we have one wide angle camera, we've got a high resolution uh, video camera that you're going to see some of the results from tonight. Uh, main data, vacuum and controls, raceways, so we've got to bring all the controls and other things across from the chamber into the control room. And uh, the main power supply. And we have deionized water cooling system. The reason why we use deionized water is due to its resistivity. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And then, of course, you have the main chamber. So this is just a quick kind of overview of what Sapphire was modeled and engineered to be. And the pictures you're going to see is really a replica of what has been modeled here um, over the course of the year. So we have the gimbal. You saw that last year in the model. You're going to see the real thing tonight. Uh, the chamber door, mass spectrometer, and remote data, uh, data acquisition junction. That's kind of a, you'll see some interesting things there. Uh, anode isolation chamber. Um, actually, that was Scott Mainwaring's idea. He says, Monty, so what if we just, because that chamber is so big, it's going to take you days to suck it down and get the vacuum that you want. If we want to change the anode out, we're going to lose three days every time we do that. And... Uh, so we designed uh, an isolation chamber where we can bring the, pull the anode back, close the gate valve, save the, the chamber, and uh, switch out the anode. And this happened, uh, I don't know how long it took us because we did this, maybe 20 minutes. And put a new one in and brought it back into the chamber. Recirculation pumps, uh, air cooling, cryogenic vacuum, and uh, a lot of other systems. What you're looking at here is uh, the main gas and vacuum control systems. And the point of the presentation tonight is not just to show you Sapphire and some of the results, but the effort and the amount of work involved with the whole Sapphire team to get to what you're going to see tonight. And what you're looking at here is really the main gas and vacuum schematic, and everybody on the team contributes to this. The questions, well, where's it going to fail? What kind of gas are we using? What direction is the gas going through the valve? Is the valve designed to go one way? Is it more effective if it goes the other way? What about an emergency stop? What if wall's right? You know, and we need the big red button. What happens? How do we deal with that? Do we need to have nitrogen flood into the chamber to assure that, in fact, we've got a safe and secure shutdown? We, we would like to be on the evening news, but not for because we've, you know, <laughs> become cosmic dust. <laughs> so we start to model these things up. So we take the schematic and we say, okay, well, what's this got to look like in real life? And we have new, new members on our team this year, Jason Lickfer, uh, and uh, he was my engineering manager with another company that I had. Um, and so we start to design these systems. We take the schematic, which is really the engineering, and that's got to translate into drawings and parts and bills of materials. And with Sapphire, we figure there's at least over 40,000 components, give or take. That doesn't even include the parts inside the computers. So this is a model. These are three-dimensional models. And we're not at the Iron Man stage where we're talking to the computer but it's really getting quite advanced. So we can take materials like this here, we can know what the stresses are, read, them in, read, them, read that data into uh, an analysis software and determine whether or not it's strong enough, its, its properties. So what you're looking at is a three-dimensional model, but it understands all the mass properties of every single component that are in this model. This isn't just a rendering. This is where engineering is today. So now we're going to create drawings things that people could actually use to buy materials and start to build. And this is uh, so just drawing of the control panel itself, the typical balloons, and then uh, we get into things like bills of materials and all the parts and components and fittings and ferrules and uh, nuts and bolts. And each part has to be ordered and you have to identify a vendor and you have to identify the lead time so we get the parts on the floor in time so we can build it. So what you're looking at here is purchasing. And um, <clears throat> I asked Jano last year if uh, he'd be interested in helping out in the purchasing side of things, and he's never done it before. 
I have a lot of experience in this, my other companies. And uh, he thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe it's calling the company up and say, I'd like to buy this part. Well, what he discovered was, what I didn't tell him is, there's this many pieces, and you're going to have to identify who the vendor is, the lead times, pricing, you're going to get quotes, and just follow up, and one other part's going to hit the floor, and you really kind of have to have the view that the vendor's not really going to tell you the truth about the price or delivery, and they're not going to deliver on time, and when they do, it may not even be the right part. So this is Yano's creation. And he had worked on MRP systems, but we all agreed that that probably wasn't necessary for Sapphire. Little did I say anything. We have a very limited budget, but it really did deserve a full-blown uh, you know, materials purchasing and, uh, system. There's a lot of components. So uh, there were times that when... Uh, you know, I'd call him up and I could see his eyes were like two little black dots. But he hadn't run out the door yet, so I knew there was still hope. And uh, he survived. Okay. So there he is. Yano is our control science uh, data acquisition guy. He's the guy that is going to be responsible and is responsible for collecting all the data from all the different instruments and co bringing them in and coalescing, you might say, and synchronizing the data from all the instruments. And so here we are in the lab, and uh, I, he's probably looking at, uh, uh, okay, is this working? Oh, too much, okay. So we have to wire it up. And, uh, and we have to do checks, and vacuum checks, and leak tests. And then we have fabrication. Now, some say, well, you know, the panel had to be fabricated. I didn't know how to split the presentation up in a different, uh, into the different aspects. So, you know, the panel did have to be fabricated, but we think about fabrication, we're thinking more in the lines of, um, you know, machining and building and welding. And it's really cool to see how things are made. So when we go to fabricate things, ultimately you have to get the raw materials and you have to get the parts and they have to be machined and they go on big boring mills and they go, you have to drill holes in them and you have to prepare the holes for the feed throughs and the flanges and the glass and all the different parts and this is what it takes to just in the fabrication level. And there's a lot of parts and they all have to fit together the first time. So what we're doing here right now. Um, we're welding, we're welding the, the, the flanges into the chamber. And we're checking the welds. I'll just let the audio carry on here for a second. Canadian flag. If you have one pinhole, you no longer have a stable vacuum in your chamber. And we, normally when you build a machine as complex, you're going to have vacuum leaks. And uh, we do, at this stage, we've got some work to do. We may have to go and discover, we may discover that there's a pinhole someplace in one of these welds. And we'll have to come back and we'll have to, you know, uh, you know plug that weld. Uh, what do we got here? And then we take delivery. It's welded up. And... Uh, this is at uh, Venture Machine and DMI uh, Precision. Uh, we have moved Sapphire from a laboratory in Mississauga to another lab in Mississauga because basically we ran out of room. And uh, this is the power supply. Um, it's a big boy, but it's DC. We have extremely low, for the electrical people, we've got extremely low ripple, which means that the DC power is very clean. Uh, which is a requirement of the electric universe uh, model because nature expresses electricity in uh, DC form, not AC, although it may be that there's responses. Um, I'm digressing here. But we take delivery, 
and uh, we're making preparations. And part of the preparations, of course, is, well, if we've got a scratch on the surface that's got a gasket, it's got to be polished out. And the surface, so this is Scott, and uh, he offered his assistance, <laughs> free of charge. And uh, he asked me, Do I, you got a job for me? Uh, I just had the job, and I said, here's a stone. It's a very fine stone. You see this big lip across the chamber here? Um, well, if you see any imperfections, see if you can, you can pull those out, because every imperfection means that's where we're going to have a gas leak. i just let you know, Scott, we don't have any leaks in the chamber door. And this is Leighton McMillan. Uh, he's on the team as well. He's not with us, uh, but um, everything has to be cleaned with alcohol and uh, prepared before you start putting the gaskets and the copper rings together. This here is the new anode base. Uh, what you're looking at is the bulkhead, um, services through the anode, because at this time around, we want to be able to bring other, uh, we want to cool the anode, okay? We want to be able to make sure that we didn't uh, see some of the failures that we saw in phase one. So what you're seeing here is a heat exchanger, and we have water coming up, and we actually can, uh, using a particular taper, we can take a new anode and shove it in there like you do in a drill press, and uh, with a small screw, retain the anode, uh, we know from the computational fluid dynamics, the thermal dynamics, that the temperatures are going to reach about 1,600 degrees Celsius. So if you've got composites that are in there, those plastics are going to melt. So we have to get that heat uh, away. So uh, we're starting to assemble the anode. And uh, um, actually the anode base, the receiving base. And this is the anode isolation chamber with it pulled back where we can actually put the anode in. And uh, what you're looking at here, actually, is this good? Yeah, this is the big gate valve. So right now that the chamber can be in vacuum, we close this gate valve and, uh, well, we close it first. <laughs> well, no, we pull the anode out first. We better pull the anode out first. Okay, then we close the gate valve, and then we open up the isolation chamber here so that we can get to the anode and replace it or do whatever kind of work that we want. Then we close it back up, open up the gate valve, and we can bring the anode back into the chamber, and it works pretty slick. This is a cathode. This is one cathode. There's a coffee cup but uh, kind of give you some scale. I didn't mean to leave the coffee cup there, but I see that it's there. And uh, it's, a, it's three feet in diameter, and the copper is about three-eighths of an inch thick. And the rings on the back are for support because you get that kind of heat, as you know. With metals, it'll start to warp. So we have to have structural integrity as well. And this is the inside of sapphire. We have the cathodes, the anode, instrumentation ports, and uh, we're going to be looking at some other things. And uh, just take you for a tour. So systems. We're going to go back to systems here. And systems is how you get everything to talk and work together. Electrical, vacuum, uh, water cooling systems, uh, there are a lot of systems. There are primary vacuum systems, there are secondary vacuum systems, there's low vacuum and high vacuum. There is high voltage systems, medium voltage systems, and low voltage systems used for controls. There are data acquisition systems, computer numerically controlled servo systems, air cooling systems. Um, we have more, but my slide is missing here. Yes. And their primary pneumatic systems, secondary pneumatic systems, gate valve switches normally open, normally closed, indicators, lights, red lights, green lights, pumps, valves, sensors, burst discs, exhaust systems, compressors, gas systems, diffusing systems, gas analyzing system, 
and an emergency stop, big red button in case one of the systems fails. And I think that's it. So it's complex. This is the main vacuum pump, and it sucks, big time. <laughs> it will take the chamber down to 10 minus uh, 3 or 2, 3? 10 minus 2 in about 15 minutes, OK? If anybody knows anything about vacuum pumps, um, this is uh, from Orlicon. It's a particular pump. Uh, the nice thing about this pump is that um, well, you have to cool with water because you've got your water cooling system, but you've got nitrogen cooling and diffusion line. What's that all about? Well, what that's about is if you take a look at the middle, it says nitrogen cooling and diffusion line. It allows us to run hydrogen in the chamber, evacuate the hydrogen out, and it allows us to introduce nitrogen into the exhaust so that it's not dangerous. You see? So part of that auction, uh, is part of the mass spectrometer is measuring what the hydrogen content is in the exhaust so we don't end up with dangerous fumes coming out the exhaust system in the chamber. Nice pump, expensive pump, it's a really good pump. It's a dry pump, by the way. Now that's important because we don't want any hydrocarbons in the chamber other than what we want to put in there. We don't want oil bleeding back through the pump into the chamber, which we think we may have had a problem with in phase one. So uh, we're not going to look at the cryogenic pump. We hear the word cryogenic, and really what it means is you bring things down to a very cold temperature, uh, just a few degrees above absolute zero, and it condenses the, the gas. And by doing that, we can, we can bring the, the chamber pressure down even lower. Down, theoretically, we should be able to get it down to 10 minus 7. But I think operationally, in order for us to evacuate all the impurities that are in the chamber, because we need to do that if we're going to do good mass and optical and uh, uh, spectral analysis, we need to make sure the chamber is clean. And uh, there's really not many things in the way of moving parts. It basically uses helium to bring the, the, the cryo pump down. Uh, I mean, the temperature of the, the, of the pump down to a place where it condenses the gas. Um, we have, uh, if you can see here, part of what's going on here, um, we also need to measure, uh, here we are here, here we are. In the system, when we talk about systems, we have one what we call a thermal vac pressure sensor. Because we need to monitor the pressure of this system before we actually turn it on. So this is a feedback that goes back to SAFCON. This is just one. And I'm gonna move along here. We've got the cooling system, of course. And we have to make sure that the water that's going into the center of uh, uh, sapphire is deionized water. It doesn't have any uh, minerals in it because the plasma, um, the anode is charged at 5,000 volts. So we can use water as long as it, um, oh, I see what's going on here, I'm sorry. There we go, good. So we have to deionize the water and the temperatures, uh, we need to keep them low, so we use a recirculation system because we can't afford to just put fresh water in and deionize it. Deionized water will not conduct electricity. So you can use water to cool things down as long as it doesn't have any mineral content in it. And so we have a high pressure pump and manifold system to distribute the cooled water out to the various uh, characteristics, or you might say parts of the chamber, to keep them cool. And we have a deionizer that actually monitors the resistivity of the water as well. But this will give you an indication of the complexities of Sapphire to make something like this work. Primary plasma measurement instruments. Well, we've covered this before. Uh, this is showing you the equipment that we have either on the floor or it's on route. So Langmuir probe, uh, it took us about eight months to work out with the Langmuir probe uh, manufacturer to get uh, the right kind of probe manufactured for Sapphire. These probes are approximately six feet tall, and they're very, very sensitive. Um, the, 
the section in here is made of uh, alumina, which is like a very fragile uh, material, but it's extremely good uh, uh, when it comes to extremely nasty, hot environments. And of course, in the past, you've seen the optical spectro uh, spectrometer that we've been using to get some of the signatures that we got, and of course, the mass spectrometer itself. Where are we going here? Take a tour. Now, the mass spec is probably one of the more important pieces of equipment in Sapphire because it tells us what we've got as a constituent gas inside the chamber. And it'll measure all the elements every 500 milliseconds and return that information back to us. So we know that when the chamber has got hydrogen in it or if it's got uh, argon or some other gas or if we end up with some strange species as some uh, we indicated uh, at last year's conference. Well, what we did this time is we said, well, look, you know, we want to measure in different regions in the chamber. We want to measure right down near the anode. We want to measure the exhaust gas. And so we have a system by which, with just a flip of a switch, we can sample any area of Sapphire at any time. And this is what goes on in SAFCON. This is what goes on in the control room. Data acquisition and systems control. Okay. And no scientific experiment would really be complete unless you had a rat's nest of wires and communication and pressure systems and pressure uh, and data acquisition, I mean. So this is Leighton. He's building the, I guess, really you might say the nervous system of Sapphire. And diagnostics, we have to troubleshoot. And all this information comes back to SAFCON. So we know if there's something getting into trouble. We know if we've got a pressure leak, overpressure. So the main power supply, as I said before, it has the capability of delivering uh, 200 kilowatts now, DC, clean. We can control the voltage and we can control the current. And uh, you'll see what happens when we didn't control the current. Okay, I think this is Joe giving me a lecture. Uh, Yandel's listening intently. And this is just before we uh, start to do the fire up of Sapphire, which you're gonna see in just a few minutes here. Now for the EU, uh, Don Scott and I've talked back and forth a little bit about the low energy discharges. We can go from zero up to, to, uh, to 5,000 volts, and we can go from zero up to 35 amps, or better, actually. <clears throat> but we have some work to do to get it refined. We have a lot of work to do. We just fired up Sapphire for the first time last week. And the gimbal, as some of you know, it's a primary instrument to use to move a variety of instruments freely through the Sapphire chamber. It's CNC computer numerically controlled. We have position accuracy to almost a thousandth of an inch, which means we can move the Langmuir probe through some of the double layers that we've seen and start to examine possibly Birkeland currents and diagnose what's actually going on there. Maybe we can get some answers as to why there is charge separation. Optical spectroscopy, Langmuir probe measurements, and other instruments can be added and put into the gimbal. And here it is here. So last year it was a model, and now you see the real thing. And this will give you an indication here. I think it should start the movie. Yes. How smoothly uh, the gimbal works. So it's like a long needle. and We can bring the needle down into the plasma, and we can move it anywhere we want. And we can use it using a joystick, or we can pre-program different types of motions that are in there or different motions that we can uh, 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 move. If we wanted to move a comet around, like say the anode itself, we wanted to move out towards the cathode and measure at the anode at the same time. There are two gimbals on Sapphire. And the patent was just filed on Friday, yesterday actually. So that's pretty cool.
And this is all within the year. So we've been, uh, we've been, uh, we've been busy. <clears throat> it's pretty tall. Um, the gimbal standing would be right now, I guess from where it's mounted, it'd probably be close to seven feet. And now we're going to start up. Uh, ben was kind enough to edit this next video you're going to see because uh, there were certain things that occurred. And uh, we're at uh, seven point two, right? This is the startup of 5. Sapphire Phase Two. Five point six tour. And we got a little bit of argon. Yes. No helium. Some helium. No helium. Not much helium. Very little. little Okay. But uh, right now, yeah, it's rising. Current is rising. No, voltage is rising. So we can... And current as well. So we are in dark mode. We, we might have this another, another discharge. So. Okay, so uh, that was the first day. And what I had uh, forgot uh, was a little thing that uh, Don Scott and uh, a couple of us had talked about. Instead of limiting the current on the first discharge, I was limiting the voltage. So I was thinking, okay, well, we just want to get enough voltage to get it ignited, but I should have actually limited the current. Now, what's missing out of this film here, well, actually, what I should say is what you actually saw at the very end was what we call a plasma flow discharge. And it resembles something like the Death Star out of uh, Star Wars. Okay. And what it does is an extremely intense ion discharge to wherever it's going and it's focused. Well, what you don't know, what you didn't hear, uh, was actually the power supply was maxing out at 200 kilowatts and the amount of energy was impinging on a, I thought the chamber at the time, but it was a screw this big. And, uh, <clears throat> What happened was, I start, well, you didn't see it in the video, but I started to see all the stuff flying off, okay? And uh, it was actually vaporizing the, the screw, okay? I thought it was drilling a hole in the side of the chamber. So Ben was kind enough to remove some of the colloquialisms I was using prior to him saying shut it off because there was about 30 seconds in there that Joe, because we didn't actually have you know, the main control actually hooked up inside SAFCON at the time. It was Joe sitting out and standing out by the power supply listening us to yell and please turn it up or down. And we're all screaming inside because we're freaking out because we thought we're just going to smoke a new hole in Sapphire. We haven't even got it started yet. So, um, so day two, we learned a few things. We're going to see if we can control the current this time and uh, not let it eat as much power as it would like. And uh, so what you're going to see next what is day two. No, no, 600. 600? Okay. If you guys are on 100, eh? Bring it up. Fine. Chamber pressure? Four door. Uh, four and a half. Should go any second now. I'm a little nervous now, you see. How many amps? 
So we have these uh, anodes we can throw out. And that was day two. So we thought that was pretty cool too. We thought, okay, we've got some good news and now we can go to the conference. And then, <laughs> and uh, tell everyone it actually works which is great. And so, capabilities. Um, should we stop to, to talk now? Should we talk about capabilities? I'm gonna fly through this quickly because I'm getting that, okay, I've been up here long enough and I might be boring you guys. Are y'all good? Okay, okay. Well, because now that we've got Sapphire fired up, the real work hard work, science work, elucidating cause and effect starts. That's when the designs of experiments starts and we can start to ask some of the questions that we have been longing to get some answers to for a very long time. So the capability, so it has the ability to form a variety of spherical plasma discharges. And what I will say now, I can't get into some of the details, uh, but we do have full control over all aspects of the plasma discharge according to Passion's Law. If you look into that, we can control everything now as a variable for us. Now, that's never been done before, ever. Um, it can move instruments freely through the plasma atmosphere. It can do synchronous and simultaneous measurements. And we're down to picoseconds, by the way. So we can synchronize all the measurements that we're taking into picoseconds. Uh, that should be really important for us because as we move forward, there's certain events that happen very quickly and we can capture those events. And we can synchronize all the rest of the instruments and do graphical overlay and we can see the history or what, what was occurring in the chamber before it actually led up to that event. This is very important for us to do the kind of diagnostics that we need to. Um, high resolution video, materials testing, Material deposition, erosion test, lamer probe analysis, optical spectroscopy, mass spectroscopy, near ultraviolet light measurements, infrared measurements, polarimetry, design of experience methodology, and questions, questions that we have. Why do ions and electrons not recombine in a double layer? Why does ionized hydrogen not go back to a stable hydrogen atom when it's in a double layer? What is the mechanism? What's the process? Why is it staying like this? Why are double layers in sapphire quasi-stable? So why do we form these spheres and they're quite stable? We don't know. We don't know why they form. We have some ideas, but we don't know the mechanisms and processes. We can recreate them because we understand what leads up to them, but we don't understand the physics. Why do we get the huge energy surges over 10 megawatts? Maybe it has to do with uh, the paper that Lowell, um, my name's on the paper too. I edited some of the things, but uh, Lowell really is the master of that paper on ion electron trapping in these double layers. And this may be an answer to why the sun's photosphere is uh, so intense. Maybe why that's why there appears to be fusion occurring in the sun's photosphere. Uh, are we getting transformation of elements? Good question. Are we getting more energy out than in? We get asked that question all the time. We think now we may be able to answer some of these things. What does the voltage gradient look like before sapphire fires? We can confirm right now that there is a voltage gradient in sapphire in phase two before it actually ignites. But we, ha we can now go and measure that gradient. We may be able to, we may even be able to measure uh, the voltage gradient before it actually does uh, an intense stream uh, plasma discharge to a particular point. Fallen, uh, this is the thing that leads up to lightning bolts. What's actually the environment around there 
that lightning bolt before you actually see a lightning bolt or plasma discharge. So is the uh, voltage gradient, as an example, is, uh, is, is it uniform throughout the chamber? We can measure these things now. Uh, X-rays, neutrons, gamma rays, and much more. And um, that's really it for this presentation. So we'll leave you with this. Um, what I'm going to do right now is invite some of the, like really the people that have been involved in Sapphire, people that you don't really hear about, uh, up to the stage, introduce you to them. And then I guess we're going to do a question and uh, answer with just the core team. So thank you. It's been a privilege. <laughs>